about the chap chapter 11, give you some very general introduction of the company financing decisions. Why we start this session? Uh, you know, finance, corporate finance is just like a household financing decisions. So as a family, you want to get money, right? You need to uh, work to get, in, to get income. You also want to invest your money, right? But you also need to spend money for daily life. Give you a very simple uh, example here in China. Every Chinese family, they need to make a very big finance decision. That is to buy a house, right? If you want to buy a house in China, a family decision. First, you need to decide where the money you need to get. As a young student, if you want to buy a house, probably the money will be from your parents, or from a friend, or from bank. It's the same with the company. If the company wants to do something, wants to do a big project, the company needs to get money. It's the same either from the bank, or from any market that somebody else can lend money to you. So this session, I will introduce some basic facts, some basic theory, how a company can do this kind of financing decisions. It will be in three parts. The first one, I will give you a very general picture about China how a company in China can get money. We call it, in the professional words, a saw, the source of financing. Then I will give you some very basic theoretical background about returns and risks. Returns means the invest, how, when you invest money, the, 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 the return you can get from that investment. The risk, I will give you some a little bit professional definition. And then in the end of the uh, session, I give you a, a kind of, uh, it's actually, it's a, it's a very uh, in-depth theory in the finance world, the efficient capital market efficiency. But here I will, I will give you just a very general idea. What does that mean? What that theory will affect the financing decision? Okay, so that's the picture, the general picture about the, uh, the Chinese source of financing for a company. The first column here is China. The second one is about the United States and Japan, United Kingdom, and Korea. From that picture you can see, for a Chinese company, if that company wants money, the biggest part is from, this one is bank. So 63% of the financing source are from banks. Which means Chinese co company, they are heavily influenced by the bank. Right? 60%, 63% of the money they need get from the bank. Compared to the United States, it's only about 18. Compared to the uh, Japan, Japan actually in tradition is quite heavily influenced by bank, but it's only 38. Compared to Korea, it's only 25. Quite amazing here, right? So when we, when we talk about the uh, South Korea, we always say the South Korea are some big companies. For example, the, South, the Samsung. Samsung, we say, why so successful? Because the government give Samsung a lot of money through banking system. But here, South Korea, only 25% of the money are from the bank system, the banking industry. But in China, 63% are from the banking system. That characteristic actually influenced a lot of things happening in China. Right? So why the Chinese banks 
are so influential, influential in China because all the economy, all the running of the economy, heavily influenced by banking industry, 63%. Another source for the Chinese company is the stock market, which means the company can issue stock in the stock market to collect money. It occupies, it takes about 31% of the stock market. Compared to other parts of the world, the Chinese stock market are quite developing, right? In the United States, the figure is 34. In Japan, it's 22. The United Kingdom is 38. South Korea is, the Korea here is the South Korea. Korea is not about North Korea, it's about South Korea. It's 32% from the stock market. It's a very tiny part of this. We call it bond market. See, 5% are the corporate bond, which means the company in China can issue bond to get money, but it's very minimal. So that gives you a very general picture about China. If a company wants to do a business in China, the source, of fund, the source of fund for them to, to get money will be very different from other parts of the world. Yes, sir. If you would look at the same uh, figures, yes. maybe 10 years in the past, like 1995, 2005, and then compare it with 2013, 2012 data, would those figures have changed significantly? Would there be like a tendency towards um, maybe treasury bonds or towards the uh, stock market or how did the figures develop? Yes. Yes, a very, very good question here. If you look back into the Chinese uh, uh, period, before the 90s, so the, 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 the figure here is about this uh, 2007. Before 2000, actually in China there's no stock market. We have stock market, but the, 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 the amount is very little, very limited. So at that time, the bank plays much more role in the Chinese economy. After 2007, actually, we have a lot of innovations in the Chinese banking system, also in the stock, in the, the bond market. Now, if you look at the picture, I don't have the data here, but if you look at the picture, that part will expand substantially, I must say. Now the, uh, the, uh, the company can issue commercial papers. It's a, it's a huge amount, part of that. The uh, company can issue short-term financial assets. The, commercial, uh, the company can issue asset backing, securities, ABS, which means if a company, I have Accounts receivable. If I if I uh, sell a product, let's say a car manufacturer. If I sell a car, right? I don't have money immediately. Probably after three months, but I got a receipt, which say I will collect a million in three years in three months. I can use that receipt and change that receipt into a finance asset and sell them in the market, which means I use that receipt. I can sell, let's say, for 900000 But I can get the money now. And somebody else can buy that financial asset. But in three months' time, he will get $1 million. So that kind of innovations in China happen very rapidly in these five years. Because, as everybody knows, in 2008, there is a financial crisis. There's a lot of thinking in the Chinese market, in the Chinese government, how to move forward, how to uh, make the Chinese market, the Chinese financial system to go forward. So there's a lot of innovation there. There will be a lot of change here. So I mean China is going into the right direction. We are looking more like the uh, Korean party now, the Korean partner. But I don't have that feeling. And stock market refers to Shenzhen and Shanghai. Shenzhen and Shanghai, yes. yes. Now I concentrate on the 
the bond market. Even in the tiny bond market, I talk about that, right? Even in the bond market, you can see the corporate bond here accounts only a very limited part. Most part of it is charity bonds, financial bonds. What means financial bonds? It means the bond issued by the bank or financial institutions. So even in the bond market, the company cannot get a lot of money out of that because it only accounts for a small part of that market. So in China, most part of it is the charity bonds and also the uh, financial institutions issue their bonds a lot as well. Uh, I give you this picture means uh, in China, the bond market needs to be developed further to make the company easier to get found. Even in these corporate bonds, you can see there are corporate bonds or listed companies. Listed company uh, means the company go unlisted in the security market, stock market. It's quite small here, right? And there are certain commercial papers, one part of that, and convertible, convertible bond. And these five years, after 2000, it, it, the, the figure here is 2007. So after 2007, actually, we expanded a lot here. So that's the, uh, the bond market of China. How actually the Chinese non-financial institutions need in 2006? That's the actual picture. I, uh, what I talked before, it's about the general picture about, about the market, about banking. What actually did, how they get money, the, the, the figure here is go much, much higher. So 85% of the sources the, the company needed are from banks, right? Bank loans accounts for 84.9%, which is 85%. And stock market is only that small part. And this picture gives you a, in, in China, you know, we say we are a market economy, right? China is a market economy. Um, which product to produce by the company is not decided by the government. How many are produced are not per decided by the government. So we say China is a market economy. It's decided by the market, right? As a steel company, how, how much you will produce it's not decided by the government, it's decided by the company. What, what is the price? It's, the, it's decided by the, company, by, by the uh, market. But why the Chinese, the Chinese market is so different from the other part of the world? Let's say some developed countries like the United States. Why the United States say, in China you are not still not, you are, you are still not the market economy. One part of the explanation lies here, the bank. Through the banking system, the companies in China are controlled heavily by the government. We all know the financial system, the big five commercial banks, are state-owned banks, right? Through the banking system, the government will say, we would like the state-owned company to survive. And then the state-owned co state company can get low-cost money from the bank. Right? If you are a private-owned company, you cannot get that disadvantage from the banking system. So through the banking system, because the company relied so heavily on the banking system to get money, so they need listen to the banking system. They need to know what the government want them to do. Yes? If you look at the short-term interest rates in China, mm. what's the current figure, like for 2011, 2012, what kind of uh, short-term interest rates do companies have to pay to banks? For short-term uh, interest rates, mm. it's about to, from 25 to 3% mm. one year. But there are some 
It's another very interesting story happening in China. We say we want a free market determined interest rate. In China, it's determined by the government. The government will say, okay, the uh, interest rate for half a year is about 2.5. For two years, it's about 3. It's the government decision. We want to free that up. So we want the, the, uh, the bank itself determine that one based on the market condition, market information. China is still not going to that further. But the bank can sell some financial assets. We, uh, in, in Chinese, we, we all know we can buy a lot of things from the bank. Probably you can get 4.5 from the, from the bank. A little bit risk, but that means we are quite uh, uh, relaxing now on the interest rate control. But it's not high, not very high. Can you just try to compare it with the interest rate you get on your personal bank account, which would be like 3.25%? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So this, uh, I give you some general picture about China. Uh, can get money in China. So that's a very general, very general picture. And then, we know there are so many different channels of uh, financing for the, the company, right? You can go to the stock market, you can use your bond, short-term or long-term bond. You can go to the bank system to, uh, to get money. But which channel you will go to as a finance manager in the future? If you are a finance manager in the company, there are some sources. You have a big project to uh, put in money. You need money. Let's say you need a million money. How you will finance your project? You go to a bank, you go to a stock market, or you use your own bank. I mean, how, how, you, how, you, how you do that kind of decision? So basically, it must be easy to get. You don't want to take too much time to do that, right? You must be, the, uh, that, that, that money must be very low cost. If it's, the cost is too high, you don't want that money. But there are two parts of a coin, right? The coin always has two parts. Why the investor will give you the money? Why the bank will give you the money? Why the stock market, the investor in the stock market, will give you the money? Why the bond investor will lend the money to you? So now we move to the other part. Let's see the other part. And then you have a picture how you can make that decision. Why the investor would like to give you money? The investor first, they want get income, right? They could give you money, they want money back. Not the same, a lot more, right? They want income, they want high yield. <coughs> but they don't want to lose the money. So they want you to keep their money safe. They want a very low probability to lose the investment. So basically, the, the investor, first, they want return. Second, they don't want risk. So you need, when you want to get money, you need to think the other part. They don't want to lose that money, they want higher return. So they come to uh, two basic words in the finance uh, textbook. Return and risk. Why the finance professors? are proud of their profession. I mean, there's a lot of uh, Nobel Prize uh, from the finance world because of that. Because they always talk about return, always talk about risk. That gives them very complex model, and then they can win the big prize. But here, I don't want to go to in that detail. I give you some uh, general, very general, uh, introduction about risk and return. First, we want to know <coughs> if you go to a stock stock market. Okay, let's back to the story. You you have one project, one million project. <coughs> you want money for that project. You go to the the stock market. You think about that option. Okay, you see you you come to that option. Okay, you project will give you money uh, return. Let's say. Uh, 10% rate of return every year. Okay, that's a very good project. The rate of return is uh, 10%. Now we go to the stock market. How do you know the investors in the stock market expect the rate of return? If the stock market wants the return as 
There's no way you want to get money from them, right? The projection is only 10%. But the money you'll get, you will get the cost of that money is 12%. You will not make that decision. How do you know the investor's preferences? How do you know the reason return the investors want to have? The stock market or the uh, bank or the bond market? How do you know? Then you go to the market. You go to the stock market. You, you tell the, uh, the investor your story. And then you, how much you think you, you, give, you will give to the, uh, the investor? If you say you give them 10%, definitely they will refuse you. They probably they will ask 20, 30% of the uh, in investment. Why? Because the gambling house itself in China is very dangerous to all. Probably the government will say, you come and say, I don't want you to open, open that, that gambling house. Close it. That means the investment will, will totally go off for the investor. So the investor wants a big sum of money from the investment. But if that project is, uh, let's say, the, 10 million, the 1 million project is to uh, open the supermarket in China. Supermarket, probably from the uh, investor perspective, they think that project is low risk, which means probably any supermarket in China get money, especially around the campus, right? around duty, around us. The supermarket get a lot of money, right? But that money, that project is not that risk compared to the gambling house. So okay, the, uh, you think your project will give you 20% of re uh, rate of return. Then you go to the market, there's an investor there. The investor will not ask the same as the gambling house. Probably they will ask lower as well, because your project is not that risk. He is quite confident after one or two years, he will get the money. He will get the money back, probably in five years. And he will get a lot during that time. That time. Dividend, I mean, so So other parts of the uh, investment. That is the story. But from the American history, you can see very clearly there is a reward for very risk. The greater the potential reward, the greater the risk. This is called the risk return cheat-off. There's a lot of learning problems. There's a lot of businessmen learning problems now are doing business in North Korea. They're doing that now. The money they will expect from the not, not North Korea will be very high. Otherwise, they will not go to that part. Right? Because there's a risk there. So any businessman to do to invest in the North Korea must ask for, for high rate of return. It's the same. Everywhere in the world, you think about that? Why the United States? We say the United States government, when they issue the uh, Treasury bond, the government bond, the cost is very low. Right? Because the China, the United States, the American government are considered, is considered by the whole world as a non-risk government. If you go to Europe, if you go to Spain, if you go to uh, Cyprus, right, the risk, the, the rate of return, the investor you ask will be very high because there's a risk there. So that's why the, uh, uh, a stable government can save a lot of money for its people. Because the finance market will recognize that part. So we call this as the risk return cheat off. Where is most correct information is the finance market. The finance markets will provide us the information, return and risk. Okay. Here's a question to you. Here's the decision that your grandpa will make. He had, she, sorry, she had, uh, grandpa, he will, 
Grandpa C, right? He, Grandpa he, he, okay. He will invite a lot sum of money. He has a thousand. He wants you to live a better life in your 60s. This means uh, 40 years later. He give you 1,000 one money. How you will invest that money? So you invest in stock. You can buy some stock, right? You can buy some stock, Chinese stock, uh, American stock, Hong Kong, I mean, you can buy some stock. You can invest in bonds. You can buy the cherry bonds in the United States. You can buy Chinese bonds as well. Right? You can, pay, you can buy some charity bills, you can buy fa some financial assets from the financial institutions. Which, part, which, which investment or which financial assets do you think you, want, you will buy? I mean, it's 40 years later. Yes? I will try to set up a portfolio of investments where I will spread my risk to a different asset classes. Very good. So you learn some, you have taken some finance course. <laughs> <laughs> portfolio, you know, to do portfolio is the kind of Decision as a person you made. What else? Think about this. What else? Forty years later, one thousand. <coughs> the picture here I will show you. We call it the Bible of the stock investor. The Bible of a stock investor. So here's the picture. That picture starts. From here, 1925, before the crisis in the United States. That's, 20, that's 1929. Right? So, if you, if the time can went back, can go back to that period, and you want to make that decision, 1925, you invest that money, let's say, into stock, a stock. Uh, let's see, it's a small company stock. After 40 years, 1965, right, that money will come to how much? Around 20, which means if it's a million, it will become, if it is a thousand, it will become 20,000 after 40 years. Give you another 40 years from 1965. To 2005, you will see it will becomes one dollar. It will becomes fifteen thousand. But that takes you eighty years. If you put money just in the government bonds, <coughs> how much will that? That one dollar will become seventy-eight. So you see that difference. It's such a big difference. If it's a thousand RMB, it's a thousand US dollars. After 40 years, it becomes around 20 something. 20,000. But, but give you another 40 years, it will become how much? Put another three digit here, it will become how much? 15 million. 1,000 becomes 15 million. That takes you 80 years, 80 years. If you buy a small company stocks, if you buy a flagship, IBM, if in, in 25 you buy IBM, you will get around 3 million US dollars in 80 years. So it's a very good investment. So I call this picture, not I myself, but the uh, finance professors will call it the Bible of the stock market. That gives you a picture how good the stock market is. If you buy a government bond, it's quite low here compared to the stock market. Am I right? The picture tells the story. <coughs> Okay, give you some figures here, you can see how good is the stock market. Small, small stocks, the average rate of return, yearly average rate of return is 70.5, quite amazing, right? 
U.S. Treasury bills is only 30.8. Long-term corporate bond is 6.2. Long-term government bonds is 5.8. Large stocks, some big names, IBM, this kind of, this kind of company, it's only 12. So you can see from that picture, these small, small stocks give you a lot of return. But if this is the case, why investors still invest in bonds? Still invest in corporate bonds, still invest, invest in uh, charity bonds. Why they not only invest in the small stock companies? Why, why is that? Risk. Risk. Yes. So back to the, uh, to the picture. If you invest the money, after four years, after five years, you see, for 10 years, you see how much you lose. One dollar will become probably only 10 cents. Right? If, you, if, you, if you only leave, I mean, you cannot leave eight years, eight years. If you only leave another 10 years, you will lose everything almost here. Right? So you can see a lot, a lot of in fluctuation here. As a stock market investor, you must have a very strong heart to take all the risk. Right? From 2008, the crisis, the stock market crashed, but now it's coming back. The S&P 500 come back, the Dow Jones come back, they hit the highest again. Only five years, they come back again. But you need to have all the courage, all the guts to take the five years, miserable times. You, you will see your a thousand becomes only ten dollars. But if you come back, if you put a very long period of time, stock market is very good. But if you need money, if I need money five years later, right, it's a problem for you. If that money only 80 years later you want that money, probably the stock market is the best place to put your money. But if you need money one year later, two years later, you probably need to think about some other source. Then the company will come to say, I, I will issue bond, I will issue charity bills, I will issue another, another part of the, another source of financial asset for you to invest. Then they have the market. So, risk and return return, there are two parts of a coin, they all go together. They all go together. We call it risk premiums. What is risk premiums? That is the extra return earned for taking on risk. We in China, in uh, we there's a there's a slang we say there's no free lunch. If you want more money, please be ready. Please be prepared to take more risk. In the finance world, there's no freedom. Treasury bills of the United States, they are considered to be risk-free. They are the 3A government, 5A, 6A, right? They are, they are risk-free. Today it's considered as risk-free. I don't know about future, but now it's considered as risk-free by the world finance market, by every investor investment bank. So we will, we will use the return return above the treasury bills as the, the risk premium. So the pre, the risk premium is the the return sorry is the return over and above the risk free rate. Let's see the risk premium. U.S. Treasury bills, it will give you 3.8 yearly return return. If you are the Dalian government, municipal government, you want to issue a bond, then probably you need to give the market, the investor, 
5.8. Why? Because you are not that, that safe, safe as the United States government. But you need to give them 5.8. If you are a big company, you want to issue a bank, then you need to give the investor 6.2%. If you are a that you are that same stock, the same company, but it's not the bond, it's not the stock. You need to give them 12.3. The risk premium then it becomes 8.5. But why? If the same company, the company can issue bonds, they can issue stock market stock. Why is different there? Why the risk premium is different? Let's see. Here is the uh, here is the uh, IBM. The IBM can sell bonds to the market. Right. The, the uh, IBM also can sell stocks to the market. But the rate of return they gave to the investor is different. Here is 12.3. Here is 6.2. Why? There's 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 a, there a difference. Here. It's the same company. Why there's a difference? The, the, the stocks, you need to give more than the bonds. Why? Why there's a difference? It's the same company. Let's see, it's the same company. Why you need to give the stock investors more money? More? More risk. Because the stock is more risk, why, why is that? The bond is not that risk compared to the stock. Unpredictable, predictable, right? Contractual agreements. The, the uh, issuer or the company must give back the money to the investor. If a company cannot give back the money, what will happen? The company will go bankruptcy. But if the stock, if it sells the stock as 10, but the stock, the stock becomes one, only one yuan. Nothing happened to the company, right? Probably it's only difficult to sell the stock, but you cannot force the, the company to go bankrupt. Stock is not, is not a contractual agreement between the... the it, it is a contractual, but it's not contractual agreement about this, uh, the return back of the money. That means it's the same company, but bonds. It's not that risk compared to the stock. So you can see why you need to give the investor more money is because the risk is different. Risk level is different. Okay. Yes. Question. Uh, yes. I recently read an article about junk bonds. Junk. Do you a junk bond? Junk bonds. Yes. What is it? What is that exactly? Junk bonds now uh, is back in 1980. Mm -hmm. Junk bonds. It. Uh, that product is spe spe specifically uh, designed for the junk. We, we could not use the, the junk company, but it's a, it's a company which is uh, not that as good as the, uh, the blue chips, the uh, IBM, this kind of thing. But they also need money. So they use, they, uh, they use a different finance arrangements, just finance that part and produce a lot of money. But the problem is that um, there's a lot of risk in that. So if you are a junk bond investor, you need to be prepared for that. But there's a lot of financial risk to, so it becomes another financial risk. If there's a, let, uh, it's, let's say it's an ABS security. Asset based security. A bank, uh, a bond 
one itself probably very risky. Uh, A, B, C, they're all junk, bomb company. But if you put them together into a pool, then it becomes not that risky. So the asset-based security is that part. We could design a finance agreement. Although the bond itself is very risky, we still can put together and sell a good price. And the investor probably is risky, but investor will not totally aware of that risk. So there's some uh, problems happen in that industry as well. Not only the uh, the drug bomb, but also in the 2008. It's about the same same origination, origination. It's still about the same, but it happened this way. So there are different arrangements to help. If uh, as an investment banker, if you can sell your bond, that will be very good, no matter how you do it. The Jack Bond, uh, but uh, not that prevailing now, Jack Bond. Probably there will be another round of, uh, we don't know, especially in China. You know in China, the local government invests a lot of money, but through, not through the government bond, but through another company. In every, every, uh, every city government in China, they have a uh, government controlled construction company. That company will help finance the government project. That is a very big risk in China. It looks like a junk bond. So there are some discussions here. You can put some different city bonds, uh, city uh, construction companies bond together and probably you can produce something and find some investors to buy that one and help solve the problem. Probably it's, it's, it's hard to, to understand here. It's, uh, it's, uh, it takes uh, it needs more, much more knowledge about the uh, the different finance assets. But there's where the innovation comes from. So what is risk? We talk a lot about risk. And what is a risk? We, 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 I give you some, a li little bit professional explanation on that. Risk is uncertainty. And expected things happen. It means risk. For example, you want to have a party tomorrow. You will buy food for the party. You invite 20 people to come to your party. But there will be 20, there will be 25, there will only be 10 present in your party. You don't know. How much, how much food you will buy for the party? That's a risk for you, right? <coughs> Is it risk? <coughs> you don't know how, how many people will, will be present, will appear. But you need to buy the food now. You need to order the food for tomorrow's party. You, make, you need to make decision now. That is a risk. So if you are not sure about the future, it means a risk for you. Risk is and third. If you give a more correct explanation the uncertainty that matter is risk. If the uncertainty is not measured, it's not a risk. Something happened in the Iceland. It's not a risk because it doesn't, doesn't matter. So uncertainty measured is the risk. The more the uncertainty is, the more the risk is. Why I give you this Definition, because I want to measure risk. 
I cannot always say as a finance professor, I cannot always say the bond is more, the, uh, the stock is more risk, is riskier than the bond. You need to tell me exactly how much is the difference. So I need to have a number. I need to have a number to measure it. I need to say the risk, the risk of a stock is 10. The risk of a bond is only 5. There is five difference between the two parts, between the two products. If I use uncertainty, uncertainty as the definition of a risk, then I could measure it. I can use your statistical knowledge to measure the risk. You all take you have all taken statistics. Statistics. There's a word in, in your statistics textbook called random variable. You have some calculation follow, for, formula to calculate random variable. Right? There is a, something happened. We don't know in the future. In the future, there will be something happening. We don't know if it happened or not. How highly thing, that thing will happen, we call it one as a random variable. And random variable, they all have distribution. I'm quite confident you know this word, you know this uh, formula. But I give you some quite familiar to you, right? If I use yearly rate of return of a stock as a random variable. <coughs> you will see, then I put them all together. That axis is about the rate of return, the percent. You will see that in there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years that the rate of return is about 20 to 30 percent. There are 15 years. If you stock market, if you put, if you invest in the stock market, that market will can give you from 20 to 30 percent rate of return in 15 years. You can also see there's only one year that, that gives you minus 15% return return. And there are two years that will give you 50% return return. But most, but high, it's highly possible that yearly return return will lie from minus 10% to 40%. That picture reminds you of what you learn in your statistical tech class. Yes? If you try to interpret the outlier yes. thing, you have the 1930, 1931 uh, that is obviously related to the Black Monday in 1929. 2002, I guess, is the annual welcome crisis in the US. Yes. And then you have like 37, the beginning of the Second World War. Yes. They try to explain like 1954 and what is related, because that's obviously the largest increase. Uh, there's a different theory to explain this. I have my own theory, especially uh, not only about the stock market, also about the, the housing price in China. The price of the stock market relates to the money supply of that company. The stock market, the relationship between the stock market, rate of return, and the economy is very low. It, it, you cannot say you have a very strong economy, then you will have a, a, a good stock market. It's nothing, it's not that. It, what, what does matter is about the money supply. How much is the money in the whole country? If you look back, look back into the 1950 something, 
is the time the United States government wants a loose monetary market, which means the government set up a lot of policies to make the money in the United States grow a lot. That makes the difference. It's not about this uh, economy, especially in China, you know, we have a very strong economy. But looking back in the 10, the ten years, the stock market is, 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 is very bad. But even in these 10 years, you can also see the relationship between the money supply and the stock market, greater return. Especially about the housing price in China. Why the housing price is so high? Because the government set up a policy to put a lot of money into China. So I mean, but there is a different, different theory to explain this uh, phenomenon. My, my theory is about the money supply. It, it's a very good research interest actually. We can do a lot of research on that because uh, there's a, the data in the finance market can not, we can very easily get. And the money supply data you can, you can easily get. But that gives you a, a, a picture for the large company stocks. It's very highly possible that you get a good a good rate of return. Only one, only two, or five out of these 80 years, you lose your money very badly. But if you see here, it's the large company stocks. That's the distribution we have just seen. The difference is because the axis larger or, or, or shorter, you know. Here is the stock, small company stocks. Here is the long-term long company bonds. Here is the U.S. Chapter bills. You can see very clearly if you have a good understanding of statistics. You can see Chapter bills. It will happen here. Not much uncertainty. Right? It's all, always around here. Small company. It happens randomly, almost. So you cannot expect it all happened here. If something happened here, something happened here. Right? But for the corporate bonds, basically, it's more concentrated. More concentrated, right? So through the statistics terms, we can measure the risk. I, I, I will not give you any calculation today, but basically it's about that. That's the uh, normal distribution. That's the normal distribution. That will give you what the random variable will work in the future. Basically, they will work this part. They will be lies in this part. Seldomly, they will lies in that part. That gives you what's the percentage they will lies in this part. So, 95% they will lie in this part. Right? 99% it will lie in this part. Then, if you can get a picture of this for every finance as financial asset, you will know how risky that financial asset is. Now I come to the, uh, the final part of my lecture. Efficient capital markets. We, we now know there's a risk return trade-off. If you want to have more money, you need to be ready to take more risk. Then I ask a question. Is it possible for a company to go to a market? You as a, you as a, a company, there's a B company. B company and A company, you are the same risk. You, you issue the uh, stock, the same product. Is it possible for you to give the investor a lower return? I mean, probably you are a very competent finance manager. You come to the market, you can see to your boss, I can issue a stock, but as a lower return, return, return compared to, to my competitor. That will give you a competitive uh, edge in the uh, market, right? Because your cost is lower. 
Can you do that? It's not an easy job because there is a theory we call efficient capital markets. The market is efficient. If you have the same risk, probably you need to be an investor, the same risk return. So we say the stock markets are in equilibrium or are fairly priced. What makes markets efficient? Why the market is efficient? Because, I give you a very direct answer to that, because there are many investors doing research. In the United States, for one single stock, there are 3,000 to 5,000 analysis to analyze that stock. There are very intelligent 5,000 analysts are looking at you. How you can fool them? It's not possible. If the risk is the same, you need to pay the return return, the same that the investor, same return return. In China, it's the same now as well. For every single stock, there are some very intelligent researchers looking at you. You cannot make fool fool fool. Therefore, price should reflect all available public information. So, a, in the finance class, the finance professor always be asked by the students, "If you are a finance professor, why cannot get, why cannot you get rich by buying finance products?" The answer always say, "The market is efficient." <laughs> Nobody can get money out of that market. You want more money? Take more risk. <laughs> That's the only answer. But if the, the investor stop researching stocks, then the market will not be efficient. Give you a, a very uh, interesting story. Wall Street Journal actually test the efficient market hypothesis. They use two groups. One is professional investment professionals. The other group is randomly choosing stock. How they randomly choosing the stock? There are, there are many ways. You can throw dust at a dark ball. You can put all the, uh, the name of the stock in the dark ball and throw, throw dust at it. Not, not by the people. You can throw by a, dog, uh, by a, by a monkey. A monkey through that stock, that, that, that class, and you can take a recall. And then use that portfolio compared to the investment prof 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 professionals. The outcome, the result is that sometimes the investment professionals really win. But only 60% in a small period of time, probably in two years' time. The investment professionals can win over the monkey throw dust chosen stock. But if you put in five years, you can see the difference. Not that much. Yes. If you put another 10 years or 20 years, cannot tell the difference. So there, that's how the efficient market hypothesis prevailed. If you look in a longer period of time, you cannot win the market. You cannot beat the market. So there's a, there's a, a strategy in the, uh, the stock market just by the stock index fund that will win most of the time. Because the market is efficient. You cannot make money out of the market <coughs> by not taking the, taking the risk. So the, here is the, uh, the conclusion from the Wall Street Journal. It may be possible to outperform the market for a relatively short period of time. <coughs> but it's very difficult to do so consistently over the long haul. 
Um, Fidelity, the, uh, the biggest fund, Fidelity. Uh, they also give a very interesting story as well. There are 3,000 people toast a coin. The head will win, the tail will lose. So one round, there are 15 will win, right? If you toast the coin, the head will win, the, the tail will lose. After one round, 15, uh, uh, 3,000, that would be uh, uh, 1,500 real state. You toast that coin again, 705, 750 real state, right? You toast and toast and toast. Probably after 20 rounds, there are only one state. But that person will be considered as a hero because every time he toasts the coin, the heads will prove. But it's not actually he is the hero, it's the statistical makes that happen. So you can see some really good people in the stock market, probably in over 20, 30 years. But it, you can only find very few. Because the statistical theory will tell you there's something this we say outlier happen, but cannot happen to a lot of people. So that's uh, how we say, how we look at the stock market, how we look at investing. So the conclusion here is that, is that there are sources for the company to get money. Any country has its own context. Remember what I told you at the very beginning of this session, that China is, is very different from other parts of the world. Bank plays substantial influence over the economy. In China, if you want to do business very good, you must have a very good relationship with the bank. That, and through that way, probably you can get some low-cost money. For every source, you need to think about the cost of getting the money. Stock, bonds, they're all different finance assets. Give you different cost of getting that money. Go to the market, think about that. How about the risk? How about the rate of return? How about the the, uh, the cost of getting that money. It's very difficult to win over others. Not possible. Basically, the, the efficient market theory will say we cannot win the market for longer period. So next session we'll do some exercise. Fortunately, not, not for this uh, session. To understand more about the, finance, the market physics. So that's all for this session. Thanks.